I'm very annoyed. He didn't even speak to me about it. We had so many discussions about moving in together, getting married, and then he goes and purchases a truck, 2K more than his yearly salary. If you're asking how a truck can be 87K, that's the price you get when you put every addition you want on it. He showed me the truck expecting me to be excited, and I was livid. When he bought this truck, we were only a month from moving in together. We got into a bad argument where he told me it was his money and he could do whatever he wanted with it. So I said fine and told him I'm not comfortable moving in with him anymore. I asked my landlord if my apartment was still available and if I could renew my lease, and they said yes. Now my boyfriend is saying he can't afford his place and his truck. I don't feel bad. You should have thought of that before buying something so expensive without talking to your girlfriend of two years. I have had some of his friend's girlfriends reach out to me and say I should support him. And one even said that I'm not loyal and this shows I wouldn't support him if we were married since I run away when finances get bad. That's nonsense. He didn't lose his job or get hurt. He bought an expensive item without discussing it. I have been trying to get him to return the truck because it's already affecting his finances badly. He has only had this truck for two weeks, and he is worried that in the next month or two, he won't be able to cover all the expenses he usually has. This past weekend, we had another argument, and I think our relationship is going to end. I'm not helping him pay for this truck, and I'm not moving in with him. I have asked for a break and will be thinking about what to do. Edit. I appreciate the different opinions everyone has given me. I have a lot to think about. To answer two questions. No, he doesn't need the truck. He works from home, and if he has to check in at work, he has an office. Also, his friends and their girlfriends know about this issue because he asked for their views when we went to a get-together last week. Only two girlfriends reached out to me to tell me I wasn't being supportive. The others have minded their business. Now for a few important comments. One commenter said, good job recognizing a bad situation when you see one. This dude fully expected you to supplement his lifestyle after moving in together. All his money would have gone to paying that truck, leaving you stuck with the lion's share of the bills. And that's why he's panicking now. Stay in your own apartment. Another commenter added, yeah, no, you were right to put yourself first. He's going to end up drowning in debt least you won't be there to see it. Would imagine he thought he could make you take the majority of rent and household expenses while he just put money in his truck. A third commenter said, the minute he was expecting you to help finance his life, it ceased to be his money. You absolutely did the right thing. That man was going to use you to pay for his expensive butt truck. Ask your friend's girlfriends if they want to give up their life to finance his mistakes, because you sure as hell won't and shouldn't. It'll only get worse if you enable him. He'd be coming home with a Ferrari next. Now for the one week update. Yeah. So I broke up with him mainly because I realized we aren't financially compatible. Before I go into what happened, I do wanna say something. I understand we weren't married, but we were both moving together into a new place and had several discussions about this move and our plans for the future, including marriage. For the people, private messaging me saying it's his money and he can do whatever he wants or you're only two years into a relationship, you're not a wife. I know that and I have never asked what is in his bank account or told him what to do financially. I'm aware it is his money, but I also know his financial situation and he was making decisions without my input that if we were to stay together would not only affect him, but also our relationship and our financial situation for years to come. I will die on this hill. This is not okay, and if it's okay for you, that's fine. But for me, if we make a financial plan and you make a huge decision without me, I won't be okay with it. And that's a big reason why I backed out of moving into a new apartment with him. I would have never made a decision like this without his input at all. The main reason why we decided to move in together was to take the next step in our relationship, but also to pay down our debts. I now have 22K debt from student loans and a car. When I met him though, it was around 60K and I was basically living on credit cards. Within the first couple of months of us dating, 
I saw how hard he worked, and with a salary at 85K, he was making huge progress in paying off his loans and credit cards. On my end, at the time, I was only making 50K. I honestly saw his work ethic and was like, wow, and got serious about my debt. I got a second part-time job where I was making 32K a year, bringing my salary to 82K. I did that so that I could pay off my debts faster, but also so that we could be on equal footing when we moved in together. And he didn't have to pay significantly more in living expenses than me when he had more debt. We did a complete budget months before we moved in together and realized that we would each have $700 extra a month to put towards our own individual budgets. This is why the purchase of this truck was so surprising to me. We had planned this move for months. We had a budget and he destroyed that plan with the truck. If he wanted a new car, there are plenty of cars he could have gotten that would have fit into the 700 monthly surplus he had. Anyway, for the past few days before we broke up, he tried to show me that this truck was a good financial purchase and we could still move in together. He told me that he had actually budgeted for this and could show me how he could afford this. I wanted to hear him out, so I went to his place, and he had two budgets. He said he had been thinking of getting this truck for some time, and he had worked out a budget beforehand. He showed me the first budget, and after his truck, insurance, expenses, and his debts, he was left with $115 for the month. I noticed with the first budget, he didn't include groceries, his hobbies, going out, or even gas for his car. I asked him how $115 was enough to live off of for an entire month. I asked him how he could afford all of this and his truck, and if he planned to give up some things. He said no, he didn't plan to give up anything and that he could make everything work in his budget. I asked him what if he had an emergency or needed gas for his truck, and he just kept saying he would work it out without explaining how. After I saw the first budget, I asked to see the documents for the car and that's how I found out the truck price was 95 k total after taxes, registration, and fees. He traded in his reliable 2003 Toyota and all his savings to get a loan at 14% for 72 months. His monthly payment is now 1166 and insurance is 573 He also still has student loans, which are significant. I kept telling him $115 left over monthly wasn't enough. That's when he showed me his second budget, which had a combined higher monthly income. I asked him if he was getting a second job, and he said due to his first job relying on him to be on call, he couldn't. I asked where the income was coming from, and this man said, well, you're getting a raise soon. I froze because I had mentioned this raise once months ago. My first job is my career job, and I work in a field where when you hit certain milestones, you get a pay bump. In September, if my raise is approved, I will go from 50K to 80K. And with my second job, my total yearly income will be 112K. But getting the raise isn't a guarantee. You have to meet certain criteria, and if you don't, you have to wait three months before trying again. When he said that, and I was quiet, and then I said, so you planned a budget that included additional income that I wouldn't get for at least six months, and income that I might not even get in September. He said when I got my raise, the ratio of what he would pay would decrease and he would have more disposable income. I asked him why it was okay for him to plan budgets with my income, but yet I had no say in how he spent his. He couldn't answer that. I told him I had no issue with paying more bills if I got a raise, but the fact that he banked on that, didn't discuss it, and now expects me to be okay with this is ridiculous. I also said there's no way I wouldn't be paying more with the first budget because he wouldn't have been able to survive on $115. I told him he didn't communicate, and this is on him because he made huge financial plans without discussing anything. Finally, and I told him I would never have done any of this without going to him first because I thought we were a team that was building something. I ended things the next day, and he has been trying to reach out, but I'm not interested. He has financially crippled himself with this truck. If, with my income now, he could barely make it, he sure isn't making it on his own. I really hope that things work out for him and he is able to keep his truck and recover, 
but I'm not paying the consequences for such a massive financial mistake that is going to hugely affect him for years to come. If I were to stay, this financial decision affects me as well and would continue to affect both of us for years. Again, this is different from becoming ill or losing a job. He chose this and refuses to budge and fix it. I now realize we are not financially compatible and that's okay and I wish him the best. Now for a relevant comment. A commenter asked, how are you handling this with so much grace? I would be pissed if my ex who I was so emotionally invested in pulled this on me. It's not just that he made an irresponsible decision. It's the fact that he thought he could leech off you and your money to pay it and somehow blindside you to get away with that. You don't badmouth him a single time and did the right thing immediately, break up, and have already accepted that you both are incompatible. I'm in awe of how decisive and yet non-aggressive you were. I wish I could be that way. I responded, to answer your question about why I'm not bad-mouthing him, it's because I'm sad. I'm sad about what he did to himself and that I had to leave because he isn't seeing how bad this is. I'm sad that just a few months ago, I was planning us living together and a life, and now that's gone. Most of all, I'm sad for him. He was doing so well, and he rubbed off on me immensely in terms of paying off debt and watching your spending. I'm sad that he threw away all his hard work. Dumping on him even more isn't worth it because when he realizes this mistake, it will be so bad for him. I don't see a point to do it, but I'm not judging anyone who would in these circumstances. Now for some top comments. One commenter said, you are very smart. I have a wife like you and we are going to retire comfortably because of that. Another added, I am so proud of you. I really wish more young women were as firm in their boundaries and as wise about finances as you are. Mind you, this doesn't make him a bad person, but it does give you an insight into what the future would be like with him. Now for the update a few months later. Hi everyone. So I posted a few months ago about a situation I was dealing with my ex and him buying a car without telling me. I really doubted myself when I first made my first post because I had received such strong negative reactions from other people about me wanting to back out of the move. I appreciate the comments I got, not only on the posts, but through the messages as well. It really helped solidify for me that these feelings I had about the situation shouldn't be ignored. So thank you guys for responding because it saved me financially. Looking back at the situation now months later, I can see that I was being set up to be financially abused. When I broke up with my ex, I thought that we were financially incompatible and that unfortunately it took this large purchase happening to see it. But I can see now that's not the case. My ex made a plan in his head and what made sense to him was for me to pay most of the expenses and he thought this was okay and that I should be okay with it too. Even though I can see the reality of what he was trying to do, I can't hate my ex because he helped start me on this path of looking at my finances. I remember when we first started dating and I went to pay for an item I was getting and my card declined and without batting an eye, even though it was a little embarrassing, I took out another card and paid. I was used to this happening every once in a while because I was literally living paycheck to paycheck. I'm not putting down anyone where that's the case. But in my situation then, I was living way above my means. I would justify every single want and get it, and I thought because I was making minimum payments and on time, I wasn't as bad as the next person. When the situation with my card happened, after we got back to my ex's car, he kindly asked if this type of thing happens all the time, and I told him sometimes, and he basically gave me advice. He did not try to force me to stop spending. He asked me to track my purchases and recommended a few apps. The first two months that we were seeing each other, he would encourage me every other day or every once in a while to just track what I spent, to shop like I usually did, but to track everything. Being able to see how much I was spending, especially when I broke it down into categories, was astounding. There was one month I spent $68 on bagels. It wasn't for work. It wasn't for other people. It was me stopping at a bagel place every morning and getting a bagel. I would sometimes get variations, which is why the bagels cost so much. 
Once I realized how much I was spending on stupid things, my ex helped me make a plan that would work for me, and that plan has continued to consistently work. I have added to it and changed things or tweaked things as my financial status has continued to improve, and so far, so good. This is why I don't have any bad feelings about my ex. He never pushed for me to pay my bills in front of him. He never saw credit card statements on apps, nothing. He only kept encouraging me to look at my finances and fix them. He helped give me the foundation to start to manage my finances, and I thought in my head that we were on the same page. And because he was such a stickler for finances, and he was so frugal, that is why this truck purchase was such a surprise to me. It was unplanned, not discussed, was a large amount of money. And just knowing the general view of how much debt he had, I know without a doubt that there was no way he could afford this truck. I'm not trying to paint my ex as a saint. I am explaining why he had such a positive impact on me financially. So when the truck purchase happened and he refused to budge, I honestly was shocked. And seeing how bad this situation was, I had to walk away. It's been about six months since everything's happened and I'm doing very well. I recently paid off my student loans last month. I now only have my car left, so a few grand left to pay. I also have a small savings. Because of that, I have changed the focus and I'm putting the majority of my income now towards my car. I'm not rich by any means, but I'm definitely living within my means and I'm okay with that. The last two things I am updating on are my raise and my ex's truck. I had a few people message me about the raise and unfortunately, I did not get it to a big mistake I made on a project. Once I realized the mistake, I knew that it would jeopardize those things for my raise because I had made the mistake so close to my evaluation and I didn't get the raise. But I fixed the mistake and when I get reevaluated after three months, I am hopeful I get it this time. Losing the possibility of the raise made me realize even more that I had made the right decision because I would be so screwed right now if I hadn't ended my relationship. With my ex, we have spoken once, and that is when we broke up. I cut communication completely because he was still trying to fix things without addressing the truck and the fact that he was keeping it. I know from a person close to him that actually four months after we broke up, he did a voluntary repossession. I also know the truck is gone because he deleted all the pictures he had of it. I was actually relieved to hear that for him because he can hopefully start to fix the situation he got himself in. I really do want the best for my ex and I don't know the thought process that led to him getting this truck or what could have influenced him, but hopefully he can get back to where he was and make more improvements. The relationship is finished and there is no hope of rekindling anything. Even though he returned the truck, I could never go back to him because the trust is gone. It wasn't only the money. It was also him making such a vital decision without me, expecting me to go along with it, and then vilifying me when I had viable concerns. I can't move past that. Yes, money isn't everything, but I can't stop thinking about what my life would be like now had I stayed. My student loans would not be paid off. We would both be broke we would both be in worse off financial positions. All of these things would have affected the relationship negatively, which would have made it unhealthy. I'm glad we broke up and I have forgiven him for what he tried to do to me. I stand and I will continue to stand by the view that finances are a breakable offense, especially when your partner isn't listening to you and does something that will affect both of you. If you don't agree, that's fine. But these last few months, have proved that to me. So that's my longish update. And again, I really wanna say thank you guys for responding to my first post. I honestly was leaning towards staying with him and not moving in. And I think in the long run, I would have been financially devastated and taken advantage of right now. And because of the different opinions I read, it made me realize how bad not only the situation was, but also how bad it could get. So thanks, a very, 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 very small humble brag. I posted my paid in full student loan email on my profile, so if you want to see that, you can click that post, but you don't have to. Sorry, I'm just so proud of that fact. Okay, bye. Now for a few important comments. The first commenter said, congrats, very adult of you. What apps did you use? Then OP replied, 
Hi, thank you for the comment. I used a basic spending tracker app on my phone. I then had an Excel spreadsheet, which I update once a week to keep track of expenses. Finally, I used a budget binder with envelopes for cash, and I use this primarily for my wants. It worked for me to just pay cash for them until I got enough self-control to not splurge. It was trial and error trying to figure out what worked for me, but I eventually did. Am I the idiot for leaving my husband after he brought home a giant snake without asking me? My husband abruptly adopted a Burmese python. It terrifies me and I want to rehome it. Maybe this would be more appropriate on a snake forum, but this problem is less about the python itself and more about my relationship with my husband. So personally, I don't think so. Six months ago, our corn snake unexpectedly died. My husband and I were both very upset. He was a cute little guy and still very young. My husband has owned several small reptiles during his lifetime, and he told me he was thinking of trying a milk snake this time instead of a corn or a garter. Instead, two months after our corn died, he came home with a baby Burmese python. Apparently, it's always been his dream to own a Burmese. Not only am I upset that he got something like that without consulting me, on the upside, where we live, they are legal. But I had several reservations that have only grown since we've owned it. I have GAD, and that thing triggers my anxiety like no other. When I was doing research about Burmese pythons, I kept reading stories about them ending the life of pets, children, and even their owners. So now I'm freaked out and have barely slept for four months. This is made worse by the fact that my husband has no experience with large snakes, and the larger the python grows, the more it shows, and also by us having a cat. The other snakes we've had, our corn snake and my husband's old garter snake, pose no threat, but now I constantly worry that the python is going to get out and eat her. I've taken to locking the cat in our bedroom at night, which interferes with our sleep since she meows and scratches at the door, and I constantly worry about her when she's home alone. I'll reiterate, this thing is huge. He is already six feet long. I'm home more than my husband, so I have to feed it and change its substrates often. I hate doing both, especially now that he's graduated to eating rabbits and pigs. I honestly think that since my husband bought him without consulting me, caring for it should be his sole job, but I'm not gonna let it go hungry or live in its own waste out of pride. I honestly don't think we'll be able to give this snake the best quality of life, which I think is essential for all pets. He's getting too big for the tank he's in, which is his third since we've gotten him, and I don't think we have the room in our house for the enclosure my husband wants to build him. His food is very expensive and eating into our savings, but it's what he needs, so we can't downgrade. The python does not deserve to live in a tiny space and eat inadequate food because my husband wanted one as a kid. At the same time, it's a good possibility it could eat us out of house and home. I don't want kids while we own a python, and these things can live up to 20 years. I don't want to never have children, which I've dreamed of because of a python. Because of all these reasons, but especially the ones about our cat and its quality of life, I think we should rehome the python, preferably to a wildlife sanctuary or something. I've gently brought all of this up to my husband, how much mental anguish it causes me, how worried I am for our cat, how the snake is unsustainable, and all he's done is tell me to get over it, accuse me of not caring about his happiness, and tell me I'm being prejudiced against animals that aren't cute and cuddly. None of this is true, not even the last accusation. I liked his smaller snakes a lot. How can I communicate productively with my husband about this issue? He already loves this snake, and I think that's getting in the way of him seeing reason. Now for a few important comments. When asked about her husband's rebuttals to her arguments, she said, as far as worrying about the python getting out and ending the life of the cat, future kids, us, I won't let it get out. You need to go on new anxiety medication. Never mind the fact that both the corn and the garter escaped from their tanks. Well, what are you gonna do? Let it starve just because you don't like it? That's cruel. He says that we have room for the enclosure and that we'll find money to keep buying it food. He says I'm ridiculous to not want babies while we have a python and says everything will be fine. 
I don't find any of his rebuttals particularly compelling because they're just, no, that won't happen to a concern of mine without explaining why it won't happen. Now for the one week update. First of all, I have to say thank you for the outpouring of support I got, especially from the reptile enthusiasts who happen to be browsing this sub. You guys are awesome. Now, I just want to say at the beginning so what everyone wants to hear is heard. The snake is gone and my cat is all right. Here's how it happened. Thursday night, while I was replying to people in my post, several people suggested talking to my husband's friend who owns Burmese pythons as an experienced reptile keeper and could be a huge help. I was too blinded by the situation, my own anxiety to even think of that. I messaged him on Facebook Thursday night and told him the situation. He was shocked at just how bad things were. But apparently he tried to warn my husband that owning small snakes and then jumping to a berm is like thinking owning house cats makes you qualified to own a tiger. But my husband didn't listen. He's been busy going to reptile shows. Dude breeds venomous cobras. He's kind of a badass. So he only saw the snake in person once when we just got it and was immediately disturbed when I told him about the overfeeding my husband's desire to start it on live food and the fact that it free roams and is handled alone. He told me he'd come over the next day, Friday, and give my husband a real talking to, as well as do anything he could to help us rehome it. I decided I couldn't live another day in the house like that, and neither could my cat. So Friday morning, I moved out to my mother's while my husband was at work. It was a bit sneaky, but I knew that if I tried to leave while he was home, he'd try to convince me to stay. I called him on his lunch break though and told him I'd left until the snake was gone. He was very upset, but started accusing me of being so petty as to let a snake wreck our marriage. I had nothing productive to say to that. So I told him I'd talk to him later. My husband's friend was so angry about the snake situation that when he got to our house, he gave my husband a serious talking to. He told him that after seeing how inadequate we were as snake keepers, there was no way he was gonna let the snake stay with us. Being yelled at really affected my husband. When he came to my mother's to talk to me, he looked like a kicked puppy. He broke down and told me he loved me, was sorry for the hell he'd put me through, and realized, after hearing reason from an expert, that the snake could no longer live with us. I know his sorrow was more about losing the snake than truly understanding the situation, but it was cathartic to hear. His friend contacted a herpetology society, and a member who specializes in rehabilitating mistreated snakes took the snake to his ranch. The snake will be fed properly and live in a suitable space. My husband and I have talked a lot about this. He admitted that his desire to fulfill a childhood dream made him careless and selfish. He wasn't trying to be malicious, but he wanted the snake so badly he'd do anything to keep it. He hasn't fully learned his lesson yet, but I put my foot down when he talked about getting a ball python. I don't think we should get another snake for a long time. On Sunday, I asked him to tell me the truth about how he got the python because his story didn't add up. He admitted he arranged to get it from a breeder online while telling me he wanted a little snake, meaning he was actively lying. This breeder was a state away, so my husband broke the law by transporting the snake across state lines, which is against the Lacey Act. I'm very angry about his lies and that he ignored me for months. He admitted he lied because he knew I'd say no, showing such immaturity that it disgusts me. I'm upset he broke the law and only listened when someone else told him the same things I did. Apparently, He's been having a quarter-life crisis about not accomplishing more by 26. I feel sympathy for that, but it's no excuse to treat me badly. I moved back home with my cat, and our marriage is in jeopardy due to his lies and lack of respect. We made vows, and I don't take those lightly. We're getting counseling, which I hope will help him understand what he did wrong and strengthen us. If not, I'll have to consider my options. Now for the update, the snake is gone but I'm back out of desperation. People messaged me wanting to know how I'm doing. On the surface, therapy has been going well. My husband has been contrite, open-minded, and treats me like a princess. He's making an effort to listen to my opinions and incorporate our therapist's suggestions. 
I feel like a huge witch saying this, but I don't think it's enough. Over the past weeks, I've realized something about how I view my husband has fundamentally changed. After soul searching, I realized I have no respect for his intelligence anymore. That's very important to me, and it's gone. It's ended the life of my physical attraction to him. I used to have a high libido, and we made love frequently. Now, since all this happened, we've been intimate only three times. Despite all the changes he's making, he's still himself, and I don't like who I know him to be now. He's still goofy and absent-minded, needing me to balance the checkbook and pack his lunch. I can't respect that anymore. I don't want to be his mom or a naggy sitcom wife. I used to love taking care of him, but now I'm sick of it. He can tell something's wrong. He's irritated by my lack of forgiveness and intimacy drive when he's doing all the right things, but his lack of understanding makes my feelings more pronounced. I realized I love him as a friend, but no longer as a husband. That devastates me. I can't believe I'm thinking about divorce after less than a year of marriage. I feel like a failure. I haven't broached these feelings in therapy yet because they crystallized only a few days ago. I don't know how to start because saying them might end my marriage. I've talked to my mom and friends and they all tell me to wait longer because I made vows. But I feel like I found out something fundamental about my husband that I wish I never had and nothing can be the same now. My ex-husband brought home a Burmese python after telling me he wanted a milk snake. I was really scared of it and anxious, but he was dismissive of my worries. I ended up getting the snake shipped off to a reptile ranch, but it absolutely shook my trust in my ex because he was lying to me. It also made me realize he relied on me to do everything for him like a second mother, and I hated that. I really tried to work through the feelings I posted in the second update, but after three months, we separated. It's totally okay if you judge me for this because I judge myself. After being separated for half a year, we ended up having intimacy. My grandma had just died, I was devastated, and he came to the funeral to support me because he'd known her forever and loved her too. We went home together after the family lunch and ended up having comfort intimacy. Neither of us wanted kids at that point, but my IUD had slipped into my cervix at some point before this, and I ended up getting pregnant. Both of us were unsure about introducing a kid into our relationship, but decided to get back together and make another effort. I had always wanted to be a mom and didn't want to abort. We found out pretty early into the pregnancy that it was actually a molar pregnancy, meaning that instead of a normal fetus, I was pregnant with a tumor. I had the mole removed, but I was one of those lucky people who developed cancer from their molar pregnancy. Luckily, the cancer was caught when I was only at stage two and responded really well to chemotherapy. I've been cancer-free since 2016. However, my ex's behavior when I was extremely sick from chemo, we had stayed together after losing the pregnancy, caused me to put my foot down and want to divorce. He wouldn't or couldn't pick up the slack around the house, and I couldn't deal with it anymore. I felt like I couldn't depend on him for anything, not even when I had cancer. Literally a week after I was told I was cancer-free, I told him I was moving out and wanted a divorce. I lived with my mom for a year while our divorce was being finalized, and a bit after it, and then decided to get a job in a new city because I needed a new beginning. I also decided to fulfill a dream of mine I'd been mulling over for a while and went back to college to get my BSN in 2017. I graduated in 2019 because I was in an accelerated program for people who already have another degree, and I now work as a neonatal nurse. The job can be really wearing and difficult, but it's so amazing watching tiny and sick babies grow and thrive and eventually leave. I feel like I've found my calling. I also met a guy in my class when I went back to school. We were just friends for two years because I didn't feel ready to date. And then in 2019, we started dating. That guy is now my husband. We got married in 2022. My current husband is the most amazing man and partner I could have ever asked for. I can fully lean on him and him on me. And I don't have to ask him to please pick his socks up off of the floor. He even does most of the cooking because I hate cooking. Due to my cancer treatment, I went into premature ovarian failure, 
So we are going to start IVF in the new year with eggs I had frozen before my chemo began. We also want to adopt and or foster at some point and have been looking into that as well. I know for sure my husband is gonna be a wonderful support for me and an amazing father. At the time of my divorce, I had no confidence my ex would be either of those things. I don't wanna just bash my ex though. He's doing much better since we got divorced. A month after I left for good, he attempted unalived and was put on a 72 hour hold at the hospital. He took their advice to follow up with a psychiatrist seriously and was diagnosed with ADHD. It explains so much about how he was when we were together. A little later on, he was also diagnosed with autism. I don't speak to my ex because it's too painful for both of us, but my mom is still close to his mom and has given me some updates. He's taking medication that's really helped his ADHD and was able to go to trade school. He has a much better job now and has been in a steady relationship. I wish him all the best. I look back on my old posts and all I can do is shake my head. I was putting up with so much I would never put up with now. I also thought I was so grown up because I was 24 and married, but clearly I still had maturing to do. Part of me feels sad for my ex too because he was struggling for so long and I was writing him off as unhelpful. However, even though he had a medical reason for being inconsiderate, I still had to do what's best for me, and I was at my breaking point. Considering his success, I think we're better off without each other. Oh, and I still talk to my ex's friend, the cobra breeder, from time to time. Bucatini the Burmese python is still doing great in his new home. Am I the idiot for questioning my parents' estate plans to ensure my kids aren't left out while my stepdaughter inherits a fortune? I have two kids, 17-year-old twins and one stepdaughter who is 18. I met her when she was 11. The other day, I was at my parents' house going over some estate planning since I am the executor. While reviewing, I saw my folks had split their assets to be half for my two siblings and me and the other half for their grandkids, all to be distributed evenly. My stepdaughter was included. When I asked them about this, they said they wanted to be fair. Their estate isn't super large, but the sum would be substantial, like a new car. I told my parents that while generous, I didn't think it would be necessary and would be better to split between their five grandkids. When we got home, my husband said he overheard what I said and that I was being an AH for alienating his daughter. I told him my reasoning was because she is the only child, grandchild, niece on both her parents' sides and that she would be set. Her grandparents own multiple properties. Her uncles are fairly well off and live in a high cost of living area. And well, she's the only kid and it's not looking like, at least on his side, that she'll have any cousins. Plus, their collective net worth is substantially more than my side. I also asked him if his parents included my kids in their estate, but he refused to answer. Still, he said I was being an AH and accused me of not caring about her future. I think I was doing the right thing by looking out for my kids and their cousins. Am I the jerk? Edit, I was told to include this in the post. One, I didn't argue with or pressure my parents to make a change. I simply mentioned that I don't feel it was necessary for her to receive a monetary amount. Two, my mom plans on giving her a set of family heirloom jewelry that is her birthstone. I think this is quite thoughtful. I'm not a big jewelry person and she has other sets for the other girls in the family, so I feel this is okay. Three, my parents have seen her about three to five times a year since I met her. Four, my nephews and my kids do not have active relationships with their biological father's sides. My niece is a new mom and works at a restaurant. I feel that financial inheritance would be more impactful for them, even as such a small amount. Five, I know my stepdaughter is set to inherit at least two houses in a major U.S. city with a high cost of living. I found this out a while back after my husband asked me to help him organize his office. I had to read through papers to know how to file them accordingly. The paper was a certified copy and was drafted soon after we married. My kids were not included. I am not sure if it has been updated. I did not ask him about it at the time because I did not have an issue with it. Six, there is distance in the relationship, but I don't feel it's my fault. I can explain this. When I met her mom for the first time, 
she made it very clear that I wasn't her mom. I didn't see this as an issue because I did not want to overstep. And as a mom myself, I could see where she was coming from and respected her request. But as time progressed, our opportunity to spend time together became less frequent. At first, my husband had every other weekend visitation. It became less frequent as she became a teenager because she wanted to spend the night with friends, hang out, etc., which I see as normal teenage behavior. The other piece is that we were never invited to be included in major celebrations for her. We usually celebrated birthdays with her a week after because we weren't invited. My husband was, just not us. She's also never spent Thanksgiving or Christmas with us because her mom wanted those days. Again, which I saw as fine because that's her only child. My husband would spend holidays with her at her mom's house, which I encouraged because I knew the importance of father-daughter connections. We also were not invited to her high school graduation. I think she's a beautiful and brilliant young woman and care for her tremendously. But it's challenging to develop deep, meaningful relationships with people you have little contact with. Number seven, for people putting me in the category of the evil stepmother, saying that I see her as other, don't think that I haven't been trying since the beginning. I include her in every way I can in the times that she is with us by doing things like teaching her my family recipes, taking her shopping for clothes so that she doesn't have to bring things back and forth and attending every school athletic event that I could. I have tried to include her in family vacation planning, but was told by her mother that unless the vacation occurred on a weekend we're scheduled to have with her, then she would not allow us to have the time. This limited our options to local weekend trips, but even then, her mom comes up with some reason she can't join, including surprise trips to another state. I even suggested a family cruise in lieu of a honeymoon to celebrate our new family, but was blocked by her mom. My husband is allowed to take her on extended vacations as long as it's just the two of them. I have tried to be flexible in accommodations around holidays by postponing things like Christmas morning so that she can be included. This created frustration in my kids because they felt like they shouldn't have to put their lives aside to accommodate for her. One year, when the holiday occurred on one of our planned weekends, I came up with the suggestion of celebrating Christmas on Christmas Eve so we could do the full family thing. My kids weren't thrilled, but they understood. In the end, we didn't end up spending any time with her, as her mom told us that she planned on having a dinner party on Christmas Eve and needed my stepdaughter to help her prepare. When the time came for college applications, I was ecstatic to be asked by my stepdaughter to help her with the applications, but soon after was told that her mom hired a professional to help her get into her top choice schools, and I was no longer needed. I have tried to have a bond with her with the little time that I have. I have consistently brought up to my husband that I feel like we needed more time with her to help build our relationship at the very least by him maintaining his every other weekend schedule. He has told me that ultimately her mom is her mom and she determines her schedule and how she spends her time. He has also expressed that he fears that if he undermines her mom, then he might lose the time and relationship that he does have with her. And I do not want to be the reason for any sort of break in their relationship. His time relationship with her hasn't changed. So maybe he doesn't see the need for me, my kids, to be involved. But if he doesn't advocate for us, then what am I supposed to do? Now for a few important comments. One commenter imagined the husband's reaction when asked if his parents included her children in their will, to which she replied, he just got pissed and said that wasn't the point. Another commenter suggested she was being an A.H., saying that treating her stepdaughter differently would strain relationships with her step-siblings and cousins. She responded that her stepdaughter isn't very close to her step-cousins due to a lack of quality time caused by her nieces and nephews living out of state and in frequent visitation schedules. Her kids and stepdaughter get along decently well, but she wouldn't call it close, again due to lack of quality time. They all went to the same high school and didn't interact socially because they had different friend groups, which she thinks is normal for teenagers. 
I was helping him organize his office because he asked. I had to look at each paper to determine how to file it. I understand having uncomfortable feelings, but hopefully when he cools down, he'll see that he's being unfair. Is he normally reasonable? People can really dig their heels in when confronted and emotional. If not, he's 100,000% the jerk, not the idiot. He's fairly reasonable, but we don't often discuss finances as we have separate accounts and he pays most of the bills. The house we live in is owned by his dad, so bills don't include mortgage. I cover my personal expenses. The only time financial things come up for us is tax season. This is the marriage arrangement that made sense for us at the time. My husband also very much desires to be in a provider role as he saw that example in his dad. I preferred that we purchase our own house together to have something that is ours, but he said that he'd rather stay where we currently are because it's large enough for all the kids to have their own space as well as being in a better school district. He and I both discussed moving to our own smaller house once the kids were settled as young adults. I am benefiting in a way, but isn't that marriage? I make a reasonable salary a little less than the median household income for our city. He makes about 3x as much as I do in a good year as his work is commission-based. My husband's own reasoning is that he is the provider. He wanted me to be a housewife, like his mom, but I enjoy my career. Commenter, downvoted. You're the idiot, but I think you are forgetting what you and your husband will inherit and what you and your husband will be able to pass down to all three children. As for assumptions on what she might inherit, nothing is guaranteed until the will is read and titles, deeds, and accounts are transferred. A lot can happen between now and then. It's not your place to interfere with what your parents wanted to do with their estate. Is it worth it to cause hurt and division? Her share divided up cannot be too life-changing if you said to think new car amount. Let's say a modest car around $30 since you didn't give figures. That's roughly 6 k extra for everyone else. No, I'm sorry, I would not risk alienating my child over that. I wouldn't say I'd inherit anything. Yes, I would benefit, but they have a family trust. When we were dating, my husband told me his brother's ex-wife tried to sue for alimony but couldn't because of however the trust was set up unless he passes away and leaves me something individually, I guess. The way my husband has his estate set is that I'm beneficiary to his retirement life insurance and bank accounts, but not the trust. Commenter, write a will where you leave a substantial part of your property to your kids and leave that will with a lawyer or trusted blood relative so it doesn't get lost. I'm sorry, but judging by your husband's behavior so far, He's going to put his kid first and not even consider yours. As it stands, my mom is set to inherit everything I own in case I pass before her. She knows to use it to help my kids through college first, however long they decide to go, allocate any differences between them, and then distribute funds among the rest of the family. Personal items are already listed out for family to receive for sentimental value. My plan is to reevaluate upon her death. This was set up before I got married. My husband is beneficiary on my retirement fund. Sometimes I feel like there's already a wedge. He's never spent a Christmas with us because he's with her. I've asked if we could have one and he says no because of her mom. But I also don't want to be the one to force him to decide because it's his child at the end of the day. Now for the update. I haven't had the opportunity to have a discussion with my husband about all of this as I was waiting to speak with my therapist to get advice on the best way to approach the conversation. However, I did receive a phone call this morning from my father-in-law, who I see as an absolute angel of a man. Apparently, my husband told his mom about our argument, and my mother-in-law went off, and this is how my father-in-law found out about it. Father-in-law asked me what my side of the story was, and I very emotionally told him everything as I listed earlier. I told him it was not my intention to alienate SD in any way and that this whole thing has created a nightmare. After a deep breath and slight pause, my father-in-law said that I did the right thing. A few years ago, my father-in-law suffered a series of strokes. He said that this prompted him to want to reevaluate the estate to make sure that everything was in order. He is quite old, close to 90, 
and has a lot of underlying health issues. He and my mother-in-law share all of their assets, and she is also his POA in case anything happens. And because they have a family trust, he wanted to include her and his sons in the discussion. He told me that he brought up that he wanted to include my children in the family trust. He told me he proposed to allow for 10% of the trust's liquid assets to be split between my two kids to help get a start on life. He then said that my mother-in-law pushed back very hard, saying that because my children were not biologically related to their family and they should not be considered. When he asked my husband his thoughts on it, father-in-law said my husband's response was that it was best to keep it in the family, but that he would consider including us in his portion upon his passing if he and I were still together. Father-in-law said this was a surprise because at that point we were still basically newlyweds and was surprised a new husband would even think that way. My mother-in-law's response to that was unhappy, saying again, we weren't blood and that this was a family issue. Because of the stress caused by the situation and because of the recent strokes, father-in-law did not want to press things further. And father-in-law said afterwards, he pulled my husband aside to find out more about what he had meant and to be assured that my kids would be included and was basically told by my husband that he would do what was best for his family and the conversation was dropped. Now, father-in-law said that he didn't push further at this point because he was getting tired from the conversation. But in light of what's happening and how my mother-in-law and husband are responding behind closed doors, he felt it was necessary to let me know. He said that SD is set to be more than okay when it comes time and that my husband has asked to tap into funds to pay for her college so she would not need to take out any loans, which he agreed to. He said he asked my husband if he would do the same for my kids and that my husband's response was that he would ask when the time came as my kids did not yet know what was going to happen regarding college admissions. Father-in-law asked me if my husband and I had this conversation. I told him that my husband and I, discussions about my kids' school was that they would need to take out loans, finish college, and then we would help pay off half of the loans together once they graduated. My husband has never suggested that anything for my kids' college would be paid for through his family trust. My father-in-law was very apologetic, saying he should have pushed further as he loves us greatly and feels like he did not do enough. I told him it was not his fault and that he should not feel responsible for any of this and that I did not want him to feel obligated to make any changes or bring it up with my mother-in-law or husband because I knew it would create additional stress for him and I wanted him to take care of his peace. He said, though, his desire would be to do so, that since his wife and he have a joint estate and that she is power of attorney, he felt like it would be more trouble than it's worth. He is blind and has a lot of mobility issues, so anything he does, he is dependent on her. He also said that based on what he's heard on his side, he felt if he did update his will, then they would likely contest it, which would create a financial burden on my end and he didn't want to create a negative situation. I told him again that it was okay and that we would be okay in life and that he was not responsible for anything that happened. I told him that my intention wasn't to be added to the trust, just to make a point to my husband, to which he said he understood and agreed. He apologized again. We told each other how much we loved one another and he ended the call saying he considered me a person of integrity which is a rare gem. Now that I have this information, I feel like this whole situation brought to light a lot of things I hadn't considered regarding my marriage. Also, writing out everything regarding how my husband navigated his relationship with his daughter and ex-wife really put things into perspective that makes me feel like we were never a priority for him. I'm not sure where to go from here. I plan to bring this all up with my therapist and talk it out to figure out what I should do but I no longer feel like the AH for advocating for my biological family because my husband and his side have been advocating for theirs, my father-in-law excluded.